This episode is brought to you by America's Rehab Campus. Get on the road to recovery with the best rehab in beautiful Arizona. Dial 1-833-272-7342. That's 1-833-ARC-REHAB. Hey guys, Buddha here. Thank you so much for tuning in to part two of this episode. Without further ado, let's jump right back into it. I can do anything I put my mind to. And I continue to do anything I put my mind to, except for stay sober. I could never... Stay sober continuously. I started at 18 years old. Look, the this typical story that just gets worse, never gets better. So you said you went to your first AA meeting at 19. 18. At 18 just, years old. I said turned 18. I became a father uh, May 29th, and then uh, uh, I, I turned March 9th. I turned 18. And then May, uh, April, May 29th, I became a father. And, uh, you know, I had kids young, and, and that didn't last long. I did the best I could. I couldn't decide if I wanted to be a thug or a rock star. I'm definitely not. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the kid's mom, she got, she left, and, and uh, she found somebody. As a matter of fact, they're still married today. And then I got married, you know, a few years after, a couple years after that. Hell, this is my second marriage. I only been married once, but my second relationship, uh, third kid, and and I'm only 21, you know, wow. and uh, it just ends up being you know relationships that don't work, and then I have kids that are out there that I'm not with, and I have all this guilt, man, you know, that I'm not there for them, and it fuels, you know, it's just more fuel. So my question is like, you know, after 18 years old, when you started getting harder in your substances. Did the thought of recovery still stay in your mind, or was it just like, fuck this, dude, I'm just going to keep... No, dude, I stayed sober like a, a, a year and a half. That's right? like your that's like your thing, that you build it up, you get back up, and then you blow it up. That's what I did for like 10 years. I, I would I would do it, because look at it. I'm also a pretty intelligent guy, man, and I know how to articulate myself, and I became a master chameleon, which means I could sit at a table with you know, a business owners, doctors, lawyers, whatever, and would discuss business or whatever. And then I can come in here or I can go sit down in the joint and I can talk to these dudes on, on uh, you know, and, mm-hmm. and relate on every level, man. Yeah. And, and so I, it enabled me to find success in work and stuff like that and do what I want to do. I started in the car business when I was like that age. I think I was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, man. And it was like, I was making money, dude, you know, and and learn and being a salesman and 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 uh, but then nothing would ever last. I'd always tear it down because I can't I can net you can't sustain drugs and alcohol the way I did them. I was always a mm-hmm. bender user. I have no shut off valve. There's no come home and you know, I think slow alcoholism kills people like really, you know, because they, they can justify it. Yeah. And, and they battle with it. It's legal. It's, you know, they come home, they drink a 12-pack every night, you know, whatever. Dude, I'm like, I drink, I disappear. Yeah, I go, for, you know, it's like alcohol, rigs, meth, the hood, okay? Like, I mean, disappear into the Where abyss. are you? Yeah. I need you to come get me, Shat. Where are you? Dude, I, I'm with people that I don't know. See, that was the whole thing. I don't know, but they don't seem like very good people. They're I don't know where I'm at. They're not, man. I, gnarly, gnarly sets, man. And, and people I didn't know, like my phone in the trash or I'd sell it, dude, and, and I would just disappear. That's it. I had to check out. I had to check out. Like, And, uh, man, I, we don't have enough time, dude. Like, there's, I have so much more insight today. And... Uh, understanding of why and what you know my daughter hits me with some like some it it floors me sometimes how well she knows me and she said something that a lot of people wouldn't know man she goes you know what dad I think you are you're a introvert in disguise and she's absolutely right and and people can't get their head around that because I've always been this right here Mm -hmm. right that's how they know me Here's the thing. On those days I wake up and I can't be this, I can't answer my phone. Yeah. I can't show up to work. I can't have people see me like this because they expect Jason Longo to be Jason Longo. I got to keep the room going. I got to make everybody feel gel. You know, I got to be center of attention, class clown, keeping everybody laughing like I got this. I got this. And so 
rolled into the car business, right? And, and all this stuff. I became this person. To tell people that know me, I'm an introvert in disguise. I mean, I would say even Matt would probably be like, what? You know? I believe it, though. I, guess, I, can, I believe I go that, back too. to that sensitive, shy kid, man. I just, well, I was focused on whatever I was playing or building or whatever. I was just focused, right? And like you said, the challenge. Like when we first got in here, at first you put the headphones on, you're like, it's fucking things in my face. But then eventually you're just like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this shit. Like I can, I can see that. It just, I don't know, man. It, it, I and mean, I'm in a place where, dude, I had a lot of years, man, of, look, I've been in AA for, I can recite that mm -hmm. book, man. Like people with double digit sobriety that I sponsored for a minute, mm -hmm. you know, but could never stay sober. Like I can reset. I love AA. I love the 12 steps. I mean, it's basic training for Buddhism, Taoism, any deep ancient spiritual culture, right? Mm -hmm. That means anything to me. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's, it's still the newest form of that kind of uh, spiritual belief system. Mm -hmm. And service, man. You seek that power. You know, first you have to recognize that there is a power mm -hmm. and you're not it. If you're one of those people, you know, you got a little ways to go. Mm -hmm. I never had a problem with that. I always, in my life, always felt like, check it out. I always felt like I chose to be here. Always. I can remember where the thought first occurred to me, where I was standing and I was watching my mom. And I had this thought, and it was an it was an adolescent thought. It was from the brain of an eight year old. I thought I was supposed to ride next to God, you know, like with lightning bolts, a soldier, you know, I was gonna fight this war mm -hmm. against some darkness. I had this weird thought, but that's where I was at that age. That thought never went away; it just matured itself. But it was always that I chose to be here, and I still have that thought today. I that belief. I know I chose to be here, and um. I also knew that in all the escapades of my life, the drugs, the, you know, the prison, you know, jails, treatment, the streets, the everything, like, it's me. I can, I'll get there. Mm -hmm. It's me. I'm the one that beat up, you know, Tim Williams, remember, sixth grade. So, you remember, I could do anything I want, remember? I taught myself how to play guitar, man. Like, I made records, dude, you know, and, and, and I, I recorded with, 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 you know, with record label people, man, and, and played music and recorded with people that I used to look up to and hear on the radio. Like, I did that. I taught myself, right? I, I, I've done all these things wow. that I taught myself how to do. I'm going to get out of this. I can do anything, dude, you know? And eventually, it took a long time, but it's like... Okay, I realize I've been here longer than I thought. <laughs> I didn't expect this, but it's me. I'll get out of here. To, you know what? Holy shit, you know? It's like you keep going to jail, you know? You go to jail and you look around and you're like, man, I don't belong here, dude. These mm -hmm. people are fucked up. And then in, in that one time comes where you hit the yard and you're like, are you right where you belong, dude? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is your, your people. Mm -hmm. Quit separating yourself, bro. You belong here more than a lot of these people. Mm-hmm. Right? And, mm -hmm. and it's like, I heard something the other day, man. And I, and I know that not, when you lose hope, that's a dark place. Mm -hmm. But I also heard a guy who was talking about, it's not about knowing, man. It's about doing. And he, and he, and he referred, he said, you know, hope is a beggar. And I thought, wow, hope is a beggar. Hope is beautiful. It is. It's what keeps you going. Mm -hmm. But also, you can be comfortable in just hoping, hope. I'm just hoping my way to wherever. Like at some point, it's time to grind. Yeah. Or it's, yeah. time, it's mm -hmm. time to take, it's not, it's not time, a time to know anymore. It's a time to know how mm -hmm. and, and get, get busy, right? Yeah. And, um, but man, no matter how hard I tried, bro, I, 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 I I lost control, and and the horrible thing was, is yeah, I could sober up, and and I would attract people from a life that don't understand that, and then I would, to me, to the, I was like an enigma. They'd be like, mm -hmm. "What is he doing?" You know? Oh yeah, you don't know him? Say a girl or something like that. Oh, he's never done this yet, you know? And they're like, "What?" Uh yeah, he's probably down in the Skid Row shooting meth. What? You know, like complete 
mm-hmm. psychosis. And, and then get sober, and I'm drinking organic juice. I'm, yeah. in the, I'm in the gym five days a week, okay, watching what I eat. I'm, you know, a pinnacle of health. And total psychosis, dude. Or down pulling up toilet water out of the city park toilet so I can shoot dope, Mm -hmm. right? Disgusting, incomprehensible demoralization, man, like extremes. Or or showing up at your buddy's house, he's not there because you got a shit and you just shit in your truck. Oh, yeah. Remember? On on purpose. Amazing. (laughs) That's amazing, dude. I feel I did. I shit my pants on purpose one time. (laughs) And then blame me. Hey, listen, I was you so, ain't home. I, was so I bad. just shit myself Dude. and you're not home. I've been up for days, man. Like, you know, that's when it, it, I'm not even going to get into it, man. I had was addicted to heroin for like two and a half years. That shit was never around, you know? Yeah. And then in my 20s, another musician like brought it one night. Remember, we've been up doing coke all night. You remember how that feels when you're coming down? Mm-hmm. You just want to eat a muzzle, dude. Like, and he was like, try this. And I, yeah, it tastes like shit. And I was like, what? And boom. I was like, I'm ready to mow the grass, dude. Like, I feel like I had a full night's sleep. I'm great. I told this dude, you be back here tomorrow. You put, here's a 20, put half of it in my mailbox. If it's not here, Tucker, I'm going to find you. I'm going to beat your fucking head in. (laughs) I know why you did that. I know that's why you gave me that hit, motherfucker. Okay, thank you, but I know what you're doing. You better have half that balloon. You said get it from the balloon spitters, right? Spices will keep balloons yeah, in the mouth. And, and you had to know the man, you know. It wasn't like today, some emo kid walking down the street with half a pound of black in his yeah. fucking pocket. Well, it's not even that anymore. Yeah. They don't even do heroin yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. So anyway, dude, uh, and when I got off of that stuff, it was like, dude, I'm an uppers guy. I told him, if you would have told me my dick wasn't going to get hard for two and a half years, I never would have tried this shit. <laughs> I like to shoot meth and chase really Groungy chicks, dude. Okay, like that's I'm that I got kind shit of to dirt do. bag. Yeah, I got, shit to do. I got an agenda. Right. Until I met <laughs> until I met the beast, man. I met this chick. And I never dated addicts either, right? Oh. I always attracted like square chicks and then would blow their mind with this insanity. <laughs> They would leave the relationship years later, like on fucking medication. You know yeah. what I mean? They'd leave bipolar. Yeah, like all kinds of antidepressants and shit. Well, I met my match, bro. I was like, I had been sober a while, like three weeks. And uh, <laughs> I saw this chick that I had seen at meetings before, and her husband was a douche, I could tell, you know, and I just wanted to, I wanted to hit it. And, and, and so I hit her up on Facebook, you know, a couple times she didn't respond. And then, like, I left her a message like a year prior, and one night she's like, Oh, hey, so what's up? What's going on tonight? And I'm like, hey, what's up? Anyway, I try to tell her, are you sober? Because I'm not going to, if you're not sober, you know, I'm not going to. Can't mess with you. Oh, well, yeah. I show up to get her to take her out to eat, dude. (laughs) And I can tell she's not sober. And I decided, well, I'm just going to go for it anyway because I'm really selfish. I want to hit this, you know, call it whatever you want. But I think it was, I'm going to help her get sober, you know. (laughs) I'm now we're halfway through dinner and finally uh, or dinner's over or no. And I lean over and I said, Hey, Tracy, how many rigs you got? She goes, what? I said, come on. How many rigs you got? One. I said, okay, I guess we're gonna have to get those two. Let's go. And I met my match brother. That chick over the next few years ran me all down through there, bro. Broke my heart. Everything did all the shit I used to do to chicks to me. Dang. Right? Like, I would do a big old blaster and take off and be chasing tail, leave her at the hotel room, come back a couple days later expecting to get crying and yelling and shit. I'm like, where is she? <laughs> she's down there fucking your dealer, dude. That's what she's doing, man. Like, the scandalous shit right back to you, you know? Crazy. And believe it or not, you're getting heartbroken. Mm. I remember I went to treatment after that escapade, dude. I had a broken heart, broken <laughs> will, broken everything. But still to this day, that chick is the one that served me up my own medicine. Mm-hmm. And in that respect, I've never been that guy again. In that respect, like doing to women that kind of shit. You know, when they know you're lying, they know you've been cheating, but they got no proof. And you're looking at them like, are you crazy? I'm so tired of this shit. And, yeah. and you're yeah. totally bold faced, lying, mm-hmm. flipping it on them, dude. And they're going nuts. And, and you know what I mean? Yeah. I've had that flipped on me. And once I felt that, I never, I've never been able to do it again. I just got out of a, a relationship with a girl I chased for years, man. I'm in love with this woman, still am. And, um, but, you know, just too many things that happened in the last four years, and it was time to separate. And, uh, but I'll tell you, 
through this relation. I mean, there was a couple times I was angry. I relapsed like four times in this time when I was with her. And, and every time there's a story that goes with it, of course, but I was mad at her or whatever. And, and I attempted to do that same old shit and I couldn't, I tried and I couldn't, but she would read my phone and shit. I was saying to these girls, she saw some horrible shit. And, um, but my point is, is that I love her and of sound mind and body sober. Like I don't look at other women. I don't, yeah. I don't seek female attention, like none of that. I had eyes for her and that's it. And I would never do that. I'd never want to hurt her like that. You know, like that part of me had changed. And um, it's just been, dude, I, I, the, the using, like Matt knows, dude, it's, it's 32 plus years of in and out, in and out, in and out. And um, I'm in a place today, man, where, as you know, I never made it as a rock star, man. Like I never, they never found me, you know. And uh, I did some cool stuff, man. But I left that and uh, I started trying to be an adult again, and what I thought it meant to be an adult, right? Because when I decided to play music, that was the closest I'd ever gotten to myself. I, I left that, I and, you on that, and I chased that, right? But in my mind, I hit a certain point where. I felt like Dwight Yoakam and Sling Blade, you know? <laughs> Fuck, my ass get banned. We only got one damn song, you know, just that pathetic <laughs> ass, overgrown, overage dude in a band, right? And that's not what it was, dude, but that's how I felt. Yeah. I remember we played a packed house at uh, Marquee Theater, dude, and we were opening. It was like we opened for the Jim Blossoms and the Refreshments and, and a couple other bands. And, and But the packed house, dude, the, 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 the stage monitor system was better than anything I'd heard. And the power from the crowd, oh, dude. dude. And we hit, I mean, I was hitting on all cylinders that night, dude. It was, we blew doors, man. Mm -hmm. And then four days later, I'm down last exit, which is some dive bar tucked away in some strip mall in Mesa. And you finish the song, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Oh, you know any zap? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> that's just the person you brought with you and shit. Yeah, too. yeah. The I same. only know 70s Joel Band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's crazy. The overage uh, married couple that comes to all your shows yeah. and just love you. And you're like, I love that you love me, but it really sucks that you're the only ones that love me anyway. <laughs> I do that just hit me, and I was like, yeah, I'm done. And I haven't, and I haven't played, man. And that was this, that was just pure, dude, creating music. And, and, I did a lot of stuff I'm proud of, man, and, and lyrically and musically in that, and uh, I have records I'm proud of. Yeah. But I didn't accomplish what I thought success was, and that was I wanted to get paid to play. I didn't want to be fucking Eddie Vedder, but I wanted to at least uh, ascend to like a national level where I could get paid to write music and play music, you know, and mm -hmm. it didn't happen. So, and that, and that in my mind was what was going to, it was, it was going to make everything better. The fact that I wasn't in my kid's life enough and I wasn't a good enough dad. And make it up. I was going to make, make everything up, yep. right? And I was going to say, but look what I did. Mm -hmm. Now, how mm -hmm. when I say that to you guys, it sounds so immature, right? Like so it's such a, a immature thought, but that was actually how I felt. And when that didn't happen, I mean, you're nodding your head, dude. Like, you get, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I, I felt like, whenever I said I, I was here and I chose to be here, like, when I decided I'm leaving the car business, I'm leaving my son's mom, I'm getting a divorce, I'm going back to music, I'm not just going to sing for other people's I'm going to learn how to play guitar, I'm going to write my own shit. And I did that, and I started on this thing. I look in hindsight at what a beautiful experience that was and what I did, but my goals were so lofty that when I failed, there I was in my mid thirties, like, fuck, man, you don't have any college degree. You got a mm -hmm. felon. You got no nothing. Now, what are you going to do to be a desirable person? Yep. Desirable. Well, what I got to do to be desirable, I have to make a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm desirable to so a hot chick, right? And I got to look good. I got to be buff and strong and mean. And I need, I need the men to fear me and I need the women to lust me, dude. You know, and I got to be the funniest guy and the most <laughs> handsome and, and everybody's got to see me the way I need them to see me. Mm -hmm. So then off we started on that deal, you know, being sober and going to the gym's not enough. You got to really go to the gym. You get healthy. You got to do a lot of steroids, man, right? You gotta, <laughs> if you want to get healthy and big, let's get mm -hmm. real big, you know, mm -hmm. it's not okay to just, you know, be healthy and, and swing that dick. You got to, 
Give me them Viagras, man, because I want to. I want to. <laughs> I'm gonna turn this chick out like a porn star. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And uh, I gotta make an. In, I gotta make yeah. an impression mm-hmm. here, man. You know because that's my worth. You know if if it, it's either my dick and what I can do with it, it's my money, it's. And at the end of the day, it, it all boils back down to that perception, right? How do we want people to perceive us? Because we don't perceive ourselves that way, right? Because I'm not look at us. I'm not good enough. Well, yeah, but in all in all reality, that's our own minds playing tricks on us. One hundred percent. You know, it's crazy. It wasn't until long ago that I actually realized that, or was willing to hear it. And I and I'm not saying I'm not making any judgments here. I don't have anything against performance enhancing drugs. If that's what you want to take, that's what you want to do. That's on you, player. Like it's good. It's cool. I've done it. I'm not saying I won't do it. You know, but um, the reason I was doing everything. You know, or it's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. I mean, that's great to have financial freedom is awesome. And you work hard and that and that that's cool, man. But if that's your sense of worth, there's an yeah, issue. There's a problem, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh the same goes with any of that, man, to each his own. But look, man, that's crazy. I realize where I'm at today, man, is I I don't I'll be and I'm not gonna front, bro. I don't go to a lot of meetings anymore. I had one of my therapists tell me. And this guy had been sober a long time. He said, Jason, what's the definition of insanity in the program? And I told him, you know, do the same thing. Oh, no, respect, never result. He goes, well, what do you think about applying that to AA and the way you've used it? Maybe it's time that you look at some other things in addition to mm-hmm. or instead of. And he goes, I'm not going to bias anything. There's different ways. of." And um, I was like, wow, you know. So I don't have anything against AA. I love AA. And I have a sponsor, man. And and I talk to him once in a while, and I've worked the steps. I don't attend a lot of meetings. Not on purpose. It's just where I've been at. But I meditate in the morning and at night, dude. An hour in the morning, hour at night, sometimes during the day. And um, I'm connected to source all the time. And... Um, I have signs, man. I see things, dude. Like, I don't want to take this sideways, bro, but no, like, I I, look, life pushed me physically into a place where I realize now that I never would have gotten to with all the benders, all the hurt family, hurt, all the horrible things that were happening. I, you know, I lost my freedom at 44. I had to go to prison for a few years, you know, and then I finally got that girl that I'd been chasing. For so long, the one, you know, and then I came home to that and immediately became myself again, like so much pressure on myself to try to, because what's going to happen if she finds out Yeah, that I'm not, I got to be the provider. I got to be this. I got to be this, right? Mm -hmm. And I got to be this persona and the pressure, dude, you know, and then pop and relapse, you know, and then, oh, I got to put it all back together and just... Right, mm-hmm. and, and 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 experiencing what that's like when you attract somebody by putting on a show, and then trying to keep that show going once you have that fish landed, mm-hmm. and then losing that relation I and mean, feeling those feelings of not being good enough and all that shit that comes back, mm-hmm. like how could she be with somebody else? How could you know? And uh, and then you know, I lost my son, man, and. Uh, 26 year old son I tell you what it's like he was a rookie man and I in and trying to get him in treatment centers you know and just like his dad he'd never seen me high he'd never seen me he was kid was just like me dude I knew what he's thinking before he thought it he was my pal you know mm-hmm. trying not to be too much pressure but you know, hey, f- when the wheels fall off, okay, boom, getting him in treatment. I know a lot of people, man, like, boom, kind of hands off. Like, it just consumed with, okay, not too much pressure. You don't want to mm-hmm. squeeze the banana. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then finally, you know, he doesn't come from a life that I came from. So I think bottom came quicker, you know. Mm-hmm. Kid goes to a hotel, gets robbed a couple times, you know what I mean? And like, what yeah. the fuck happened? Well, you're brand new. That's what happened, you know. But that's okay, thank God, you know. And he finally, he landed in a treatment, in a sober living, man. And, and I, I, 
just talking to him, dude, you need to commit. I don't, you know, he, he got into the car business like his dad against my best wishes, you know, and of course he's really good, dude. He's a fucking paying up salesman, dude. And uh, I don't care how much money you make, bro. He's just stay in that sober living, man. You commit. Don't go out and buy a car. Don't get in above your head. Man, he did everything, dude. He got a sponsor. He picked, completed his ninth step, men's. He was feeding the homeless, man. He was hanging out with his sponsor. He was in sober living like six months. And um, he went from being a fucking atheist, dude, to like having a, a got, you know, and he got into cycling. He was big in the gym and steroids and all that shit. And then he found that bike and just all these things. He was transforming, man. We talk every other day. You know, he's my baby boy. And uh, I told my, my chick and my mom and my sister, uh, I feel like God's going to take my son from me. Dude, I've been very intuitive my whole life, right? And um, I said, I feel like God's going to take my son from me. Oh, Jason, you're just worried father, you know, and whatever. And uh, for the things I've done, because I've done horrible things, man, when I was using. And um, I've hurt people. And um, I ended up going to, we would talk every other day, and then I ended up relapsing for like a week or something, two weeks, and I landed in a treatment center. I remember thinking, it was on Friday night, and I got to call my Brody, you know, but I don't want to call him because he's on my mind heavy. I don't want to call him. He's going to be mad at me. I feel like he's going to be mad at me. And then Saturday, same thing. He's on my mind. I'll switch till I get out of here, and then I'll call him. I mean, he obviously knows. And then Sunday, I had three days to go to get out of that treatment center, and they and my my significant other came and got me, and I whew, handed me the phone. My brother was on the phone, so I shouldn't have brought this shit up. Sorry, brother. Hey, so they uh, I said take me, take me to see him, and um, thank you. I got there. I'm walking in the house, and cops jump from me. He can't go in there, and it's a tussle, you know. And his mom's there. She's hysterical. And I told him, hey, I'm going to see my boy. Dude. He's, you don't want to see this, you know. He'd been in there for two days. And uh, I guess fentanyl kind of, it really accelerates the decomposition process, you know. It's like, all due respect, man. You didn't get the fuck out of my way. You know, I'm see my son or I'm going to mow you down. You get in there, please. And uh, so they just left the body back open, you know. And um, and I got to grab him and hold him in my arms, you know. Run my fingers through his hair and, and hug his face. And he had this chain on. And it was squeezing his neck. It was cutting into his neck. He was so swollen, you know. I took it off him right there, and I put it on, and I've never taken it off since. And uh, after that, man, I remember at his funeral. You can only imagine the emotions, dude. Like, whatever God is, dude, if I could have turned him into, like, a human form, I would have mauled him with my bare hands, you know. Like, you motherfucker, I turned my head for one second. And uh, so much anger and rage and guilt and shame. And uh, it was hard to speak, you know, but I, I spoke at his funeral. And at some point I said, you know, I don't know, to lighten the mood or whatever. I just said, you know, my son, he knows me. Don't send me a fucking butterfly or a hummingbird or some bullshit. I mean, you know, you're going to throw something at me, dude, because I'm not going to start talking myself into, like, oh, I think he was there. And uh, it was a tough year, man. It was a tough year. That was September uh, 11th, um, 2021. So it's been a little over a year. And um, that image of him... In that body bag, you know, like I just every day, all day, just and uh, it pushed me into a place, bro, where I quit. I just stopped giving a fuck. I give no fucks, man. But not like I give no fucks. I'm gonna go throw my life down the toilet. I stopped giving a fuck about things I should have stopped giving a fuck about a long time ago. 
and um, what people think of me. You know, my job is not my identity any longer. Yeah. I'm grateful for my job. I, I do well. There's people that make millions of dollars. I'm not a millionaire, but I'm very grateful for my life. It's abundant, man. And um, what others think of me or how I look, or I just do not care. I don't care. And being in this place, I realized that I never would have got here. There, there, it, I had to physically be pushed. And it's like my son left me this gift. And his mom has experienced something similar. I don't know, I'm afraid of anything, man. And um, basically in a cocoon for a year. And I, But reading a lot and researching a lot of information, man, everything from you know, extraterrestrial life forms, history, ancient civilizations. You know, I've really always been attracted and drawn to quantum theory, morphic resonance, and that. It's basically why meditation works, you know, the power of intention. Man. Like, where you focus your energy is where you focus your attention, mm -hmm. your intention, you know, and um, research. And I didn't know why at first. I was just going to work, go through the motions, come home and turn the TV on and just, you know, and reading books and audio books. And I realized that what I was doing was looking for my son in the beginning. You know, it's like, he's in a better place. Yeah, okay, motherfucker. Like, that's what we tell each other, but now it's my son. I know you want me to feel better and you love me and that's what we tell you, but that doesn't work for me. I need to know where he is, man. Like, I need to know. Now I need to know. Yeah. And, uh... But what ended up happening, man, is I was just drawing myself to all this information that my soul desired and had to have. And in that came this feeling of, well, like I say, I started meditating. And uh, I follow this Dr. Dispenza. Check him out, you know. Um, and Linton, a guy named Linton. And... They'll really, they, they do have done a lot of work over the last two decades, man, on uh, quantum physics and meditation. And um, it, it'll blow your mind. You know, the Buddhists have known this for thousands of years, mm -hmm. right? And I've been hearing people in AA for 30 something years, and every single person talks about meditation says, I started meditating and it's changed my life. At first, I sat down, my brain went everywhere, but eventually, and da da da, right? And I'd hear it over and over again. Once in a while, I would be moved by a speaker or something. I'd go home. I'd cross my legs. I'd meditate. My head would go everywhere. I could fuck it. Let's go to the gym, you know? Yeah. Hey, I got to go to work, you know? Yeah. Well, at the risk of sounding like a sellout, man, I have, uh, I have a life today that is um, I'm in a place I never thought I would be. I lost hope that I would ever be here. And I didn't know that this is exactly where it w was. And it's still opening up every day. But I have a coherent brain and a coherent heart most of the time. And if it gets out of incoherent, I bring it back into coherency. And in that way, my intuition is clear. And I see things. And I, and I see signs. And things show themselves to me, man. Source. God. The Great Spirit. And I follow that, and and I integrate it into my third plane reality. But this is where I'm supposed to be. My son throws shit at me all the time. I'm not one to fuck around with this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. My daughter, she has mediums that she sees, and some incredible things have happened. You know, like you know, at one time he said, my son came through and said he didn't want. To his dad to see him the way he saw me. He was in bad. He felt bad about how I saw him, you know, and, and wanted me to see him differently or something. And another time he had mentioned that he couldn't get to me because I was in a shame hole. But I won't go into it. But, yeah. dude, she had things that, like, it blew my mind. I thought, wow, wow these people are real. You know, mm -hmm. they can really, they're in touch with the other side like that. And then his mom has experienced things, you know. Well, I'm going to tell you a few things here real quick. That, like, my son, I, I just didn't think, I know, it was guilt and shame. I've dealt with a lot of this, you know. And uh, 
I wasn't a good enough dad and I could have done things different, man, you know, and all that shit that comes. And um, I was in a meditation a few months ago. And I'm in it, so I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just in this meditation. And all of a sudden, man, I start to see like a lot of purple, right? Sometimes like watercolor purple. And then you're in a place where you're, I'm no one in no place, no thing, no time, no anything. You're just consciousness. And it's washing over me, right? And all of a sudden, I start to get like scared and anxious and excited at the same time because I can't figure out what it is, but and, I, and then I'm getting my head around it. My son is here, his presence. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, like it's not, I'm not seeing him, but he's here. Mm -hmm. Like it's in a, it's in an unseen, untangible. And it's like, oh my God, you know, but I stay in the meditation and I, I get this warm electric charge, dude, like all the way to my fingertips to wow. the end of my toes, dude, like just lights me up. And then tears just start coming. Not upset, I can't breathe, tears, mm -hmm. just water, just tears, just flowing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just in it, and I'm like, oh my God, he's here, you know, Brody, you know. And it's so much, man, that like it, it leaves, and I kind of open it. Like, Surely he's standing in here somewhere, dude. This is like, I've never experienced anything like this before, this shit, you know. And uh, it's, I believe it. I believe in it. I've heard of it. But to be in it, yeah. like, I, I've never. Yeah. And uh, oh, my eye's not there. So I come, I stay in it. And I stay in the meditation. And it hits me again. And then it leaves. And in that, and I have a shrine there for him in my room and that. And uh, I stay with my mom now. You know, I, I moved there on a quick, you know, fuck you, fuck you, keep everything, you know. Um, mom, I need to sack out for a minute. <laughs> I got there and I realized my mom was struggling. Yeah. She's from the, she had some strokes and that. And yeah. I was like, I guess I'm going to be here taking care of my mom for the foreseeable future. So I have this shrine set up in there. And I just, ever since that moment, I've known my son is with me. And um, I go over to his mom's, um, about a month ago, I'm buying a welder from her husband because I'm trying to learn new things, man. And I'm restoring bikes again. And I've been built like vintage bikes. And I'm riding mountain bikes and building those. And I've got all these projects I'm creating again. I haven't written any music. I, I've picked my guitar up a couple of times and I start to get a melody. But right at the time I start to, is the time where I'm going to start laying some words over this. I just start crying, right? Mm -hmm. So I just am not there yet, but I've been creating other things, building stuff. And I'm building raised gardens for my mom right now. But anyway, I'm buying this welder. His mom's not there. She's at a you know, Mexican family drunk football party or something, you know, like family event. <laughs> right? She comes home in the Uber, and um, her and her husband and I are out there talking. And she goes in real quick. She goes, hey, have you seen Brody's room? And she has an entire room for my son, you know, and she's got his bike that he fell in love with. He was riding that bike. Man, it's very symbolic. I actually got the bike. It's a long story. I won't get into it, but I got the bike, and she stole it from me. So my ex, his mom is the kind of woman that will steal your bike and ask you if you want to come see it. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> but it's my son's mom, so I don't fuck with it. Sure, I'll come see your bike, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And I go up there, man, and and I go look at this bike, and it's like, leaning against this altar, you know, like this, right? And it's got Christmas lights in it, and she's got Dia de los Muertos stuff. It's very impo important to her, and everything is all mean stuff. And I said, Jan, this is beautiful in here. And uh, we sat back, and we're talking, and we're sitting standing like this, and there's that wall over there where all the stuff is, and we're talking, and she's recently been diagnosed with this autoimmune disorder body's like trying to kill itself basically and i felt moved i wanted to share this with her and tell her some of the stuff i felt moved to share with her th the things i've been studying right mm -hmm. and the information i've been getting and uh so i start to tell her about it and you know we're making ourselves sick you know that's what we do we make ourselves sick there's no such thing as a cancer gene mm -hmm. right it's 
the autonomic nervous system, like living in flight or flight chemicals in your body. We, we stress our bodies to a point that things start to go rogue. Mm -hmm. Man, I start to tell her this and you've got to hear me on this. And all of a sudden, boom, we were both like, whoa, the bike flies off the wall and lands in the middle of the floor, two and a half feet off the wall from, from this. Yeah. And I were like, and I look at her, and our eyes are this big, and I start dying laughing. That's my son, dude. Mm -hmm. Zero, <laughs> nothing left to conjecture, okay? It's not like the bike was topsy-turvy kind yeah. of balancing it. It was entangled in lights, okay, and leaning against this thing and th thrown off. And the stuff behind it tipped over, yeah. like things that were behind it, like the deer, that were very important. His mom, she had like these three things, and they tipped over. And I, dude, I get chills every time I tell the story because I'm just like, and then tears, man. Like, he's fucking around. I could hear my son laughing, you know? Like, I almost hear him <laughs> laughing. Mm -hmm. And I leave that. And for me, man, it's like the veil between here and there is this thin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The veil between God and you and me we're all connected, man. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. And when I love you, when I do service for you, I do service for the whole myself. Mm -hmm. When I hate you, when I ill feelings, mm. anger, resentment, you know, whatever, thoughts, even thought, I affect me. I mm -hmm. affect us. It's all one thing, man. And spirit, soul, it's right here. And when that happens, it's like, Dad, you're on the you're on the spot. You're here, man. You got it. I'm good. You know, like I'm with you. And uh, I talked to him out loud, man. And I'm not a crazy person. Like, mm -hmm. like he threw something at me, right, dude. He's in my my mom's. My mom's very like. And she goes, I've never felt a presence as much as I feel Brody in here. And my mom's real sensitive to that stuff. I'm talking to her a week and a half ago. We're in the kitchen, and she's cleaning up. And, and all of a sudden, she's got this bowl of lemons and limes, Matt. And the, they're plastic ones, but they look real. A lemon and a lime fly out of the bowl and land on the fucking ground, on the wood floor. Dunk, dunk. Wow. I'm like, I immediately go into, no, nah, Mom. She goes, Jesus, Brody. And I'm like, oh, it's, the window's got to be open. It's, you know, and I know it's him, but I'm like trying to talk myself out of it. And my mom's like, okay, Jason, whatever, you know. It's just so unbelievable. Even though I believe it, it's like, there it is. And there's no way to question it. There's not an open window. There's mm -hmm. not anything. Yeah. It's just, what the fuck? <laughs> and then the next day, I'm talking shit about it. It's just, oh, it's something, you know. It's, my, I come out, my mom's sage, he's got the sage going. <laughs> Ma Dukes. Ma Dukes. I said, Mom, what are you doing? She goes, Jason, Brody's picture. There's the fireplace, right, and the mantle. There's a picture of him up there with other pictures. That day that that happened, the day before, I actually was walking past the fireplace, and I stopped, and I was staring at that picture for like a minute. And I remember having this thought, like, at that time in his life, he was struggling with something. I could just see it in his eyes. I mean, it's just that quick thought that you think, but I'm just admiring my son's picture. You know, I always know it's there, but I never stop. And then, you know, that night, the lemon thing and whatever. And Mom's sage in the next morning. She's like, Brody's picture was in the middle of the living room floor, face down right there. Man. Dude, my mom, my mom's got to be dramatic about everything. She's like, he's trying to tell us something. There's Maybe there's evil. This kid is acting <laughs> crazy. I think it's a negative entity on it, you know, or something. I'm like, mom, it's not like that. It's not like that. Man. He's here. Bro, I just, and I, there's zero exaggeration, bro, and there's zero anything. Like, I don't fuck around with that shit. Yeah. It's that <laughs> crazy. Like, dad, quit talking shit, motherfucker. You know, what do you want me to here it is, man. He just keeps throwing shit at me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you said, uh, you know, you know that a dove and a butterfly ain't gonna cut it. You need that shit to be thrown at you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly how it's been. I'd look for every avenue and there's zero. And again, I can like hear him laughing and and I know he's with me, man. And all these things that I 
that I believe it's one thing to believe and it's another thing when you know. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I know, man. I I quit watching TV six months ago at all. Totally. I haven't been on social media in forever. Good for you. You know, I, I meditate, man. And you know, these, everything that I've been building, I build for other people. Like I, I, I'm, I'm building this bike for my dad, right? This old bike that he used to have, he bought in 1972 and I was born. And that was the first time I love bicycles. Okay. Like okay. you name it, mountain bikes, low rider bikes. The one that got stolen in Tempe. My dad's? Yeah. I don't know. Right, right, remember? We're eating the ice cream. Went to get ice cream. No, that was no, that was that swing I had. Oh god, dude. That's another story. (laughs) Anyway, dude, I was always built bicycles and I started building them again. And I don't know, my dad had this Schwinn varsity and he kept it. My dad's 73 years old, dude. He still rides 20 miles three times a week on his bike, right? That's crazy. And he has fond memories of this yellow bike. I don't know what happened to it. I just think I had something to do with it. So I found one, and I'm rebuilding it, restoring it. You know, I'm building my mommy's raised garden. It's just, I don't know what it is, but people have been dealing with me in my life, like my family and friends and stuff for a long time, and it's the first time ever. They don't need to tell me. I know I'm not the same human being I was a year ago, man. Mm -hmm. And um, I've wanted to be a different human being for a long time. And I tried everything I thought I could. You know, I got rid of, I quit. It's everything that I did that could do the best I could do it. Mm-hmm. But somehow, and I don't understand how, but my son left. And what I know today is that I knew he was going to leave, man. But it just wasn't for the reason I thought. Somewhere in my cell memory, dude, I knew his time here was short. But I don't know anything other than that. And I don't know why, but in his leaving has put me into a place where this is the only the beginning, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, my job is not my identity. Uh, Matt asked me to come do this. And, dude, I've been, like, really kind of hermit, you know. I, I just, not in a bad way, just it's been a time for me just to be to myself and with God and, and my son and my family and, like, but in a positive service uh, mm-hmm. way. and um, I think we all have that fake facade of what life really is, and we think it's out with your buddies or out having to be doing all these things and shit like that when actually life just is about like learning about ourselves and being a better person by ourselves or sharing it with somebody else mm-hmm. or whatever, but it's not what we thought it was. Right. And, and I think I've gotten there too the past couple of years, but it, it yeah. definitely is – it's not as grandiose as we mean. And it's life is boring. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, yeah. compared to what we used to do, you know, and, and, right. and I love my life today. My life today is a lot different than it's been. Uh, it's been this way for about the past five years, you know, and, and I made change, got married, and my life looks completely different than what I thought it was going to be, you know, it used to be right. going to the gym. What time are we going, right, right. you know, Hey, let's go do this. Let's do that. You know, now I get to share it with somebody and be a positive influence. And and I'm also a hermit. Like I don't like going anywhere. Like I'm, I go to work, you know, I'll say, Hey, let's meet up for lunch or I'm at home. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not a, she's like, you want to go to the Super Bowl experience? I'm like, that's a whole lot of motherfuckers down there. Like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, like, I don't good. need to be out there. But, right. you know, from, you know, where we were a long time ago to where we are today, completely different. Totally. We wouldn't have been able to sit here and talk like this. We'd have been talking about what the fuck we're going to, to right. disrupt. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. You know, you know what we're going right. to do or what can we go get? Yeah, what more can we get? What 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 else is going to make yeah. me better than where I am yeah. right now? Yeah. Yeah. What else do I need from where I'm at now? What's going to take me to the yeah. next level? Mm-hmm. Hey, we got to be here at this time. How do I look? Mm-hmm. Am I looking all right? All right? That's <laughs> you know? Exactly right. What am I ordering for breakfast? Right. Exactly. You know. Hey, okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Here they right, come. Right. You know what I mean? And it's, <laughs> exactly. It's just, it doesn't even matter anymore. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Dude. It doesn't matter what I look like. I I mean, do I want to be presentable? My wife wishes I'd clean up a little more, dress up a little more. Yeah. I don't care what people think about me. I know. I know what I am. I know who I am. I'm loyal. I'm humble. I'm loving. I can be all those things. And and before I used to never want to be any of them. Right. At least I didn't want you to think anybody to think that I was. Exactly. You know. And like, so like I'm everything I never thought. I I'm everything I I heard somebody say one time. 
I, I'm everything I never thought I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And yeah. I think, wow, yeah. it's not always grandiose. It could be yeah. some, it could be some domino shit, like yeah. some random. You're like, I'm coming down here. I'm like, right, buddy, I'm I'm old man, and and I thought computers were gonna go away someday, right? I know Joe Rogan says cool <laughs> shit, and he's got a podcast. I don't even listen to him. I don't know mm-hmm. what they are. I didn't ask myself a million questions. I'm like, it's probably about drugs and in, in life yep. and that kind of thing. And who knows? Maybe there's some and. and probably 10 people listen to it and who knows, but maybe there's one person mm-hmm. and, and they're like, Whoa, you know, and they move, they get moved. And maybe that sets a trajectory off of something that just out of oh, the yeah. scope yeah. of oh, whatever sure. do, but it's like a friend wants something, needs something for the positive. Yep. Mm-hmm. And dude, everything is symbolic in my life. Dude, these bikes that I, that I tear apart and I work on, dude, I, I love it. Right. I love doing tear, tear it down to the last I love history, dude. Anything old, I love it, and I get in there. Except women, and yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> well, old women though, too. You know. Yeah, they even start looking. Oh, yeah. like that, right? <laughs> I get older, you know. They're looking. You should go to the gym, or what? <laughs> How much do I? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Can you uh, write your mentions? Down here? You know, you talk about you talk about you know how what you things that we wouldn't think we'd be doing. The, a couple of weeks ago, the, my wife turned to me and we're sitting at home and she's like, you know, I'd like, maybe we should try to do that. And I was like, do what? She's like, that commercial, um, Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to check myself for a minute and I'm like, fucking, that's that in emos and them fucking nerds. And, and I was like, well, why the fuck not? Why not? Why hey, not? You, hey, we'll right. sit at home and play some Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons are <laughs> oh, fucking cares. dorks, right? Like, hey, <laughs> yeah, dude, in prison, man, all the fucking skinheads play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> That's fucking <laughs> crazy. Fucking weirdos, yeah. dude. Like, they ding dongs, man. And they're like, oh, you're, oh, yeah, you're doing the fucking uh, what's that shit? Anyway, uh, they're all fucking yeah. hard Role soldiers. And shit. Yeah, like playing dice. I'm a, a triple level elven warrior or whatever like, like magic the gathering oh well, yeah you're fucking was that role harry, models yeah. harry potter motherfucker yeah, larp yeah. live action role playing larp dude yeah. i always, yeah. always yeah. talk to zane about like oh going to a fantasy football like live draft and then like when your turn comes up you're like i'll take uh professor dumbledore with my third pick in the second round <laughs> and then be like what the fuck <laughs> Yeah, man, dude. dude, I appreciate you coming, Jay. Like, yeah, man, always sharing good stuff, and it's always good to see you. And I'm, I'm real happy for you that you're in the place you're at. Well, thanks for having me, man. I hope I didn't fuck anything up. Nah, man, you you sounded great, and I loved what you said about how you know when you were talking about being eight years old, that thought that you had was an eight year old thought, and then when you went into the music, how you said that was such a huge part of your identity. I remember, man, being younger, praying. Like, God, if I can't make it in the music industry, take my life because there ain't nothing else that's going to make me happy. Like, this is the shit that I want, right? It's amazing how once that gets stripped from you, like you said, that thought even matures. Now you're creating in other ways that you never even experienced. It's the same exact love that you had for the music, but now it's outsourced into something completely different. You know, that shit's real, man. Creativity is the purest form of love, man. Mm -hmm. Creation. I've heard Everything's that. creation, right? Mm-hmm. Even even you deciding what you want tomorrow to look like. Yeah. Your thoughts. For you, your yeah. thoughts. Mm-hmm. You're creating. You're, you're yeah. the creator of your life, man. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the co-creator of your mm-hmm. life with Source. But you create, we create anything you want, man. Yeah. yeah. And and for so long, right? Fear. Yeah. Fear. Create, that yep. fucking corrosive thread it talks about. It's in mm-hmm. everything we do. What do I look like? They're going to find out I'm not good enough. You know, like all that shit. You mm-hmm. know, what if this happens? What if, all the things that that stopped you from doing or kept me from doing or, or, you know what I mean, or affected the choice I made here and there. When you don't have that and when you can find a place of like coherency, man, where you're not judging everybody mm-hmm. and fucking getting pissed off, you know, and cussing at people and, you know, and like being your, listen, if you want to change your personal reality, you have to change your personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to change everything. That means those old fucking uh, oaths you took and, and Mm -hmm. I'll never do, and you know, and I'll always be like this and blah, blah, blah. Everything. You have to change who you are. 
Mm-hmm. And if that means playing Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> and wearing women's underwear, you right. know, or whatever you want to do. Dusty. Then, mm-hmm. that's, that's what you do. <laughs> you know, you'll have a different life. So, you know, I, I really am grateful that you came and shared your story, bro, because like you said, and we've had these conversations recently, my wife and I and stuff, and it's just it's weird how certain people get put into your life for a reason, right? Certain things happen for a reason. I really do feel like there's certain people in this world that just they just have a different path. They were meant to be against the grain. They were meant to be those rebels. Because and, and looking at it now, listening to your story, you would have never thought. I'm sure there were times in your life where you felt like all the shit that you went through was in vain. Like, why me? What the fuck? Why the relationship with my dad? You know, being the black sheep of the family. And it's weird when you start seeing how even, you know, you might have even felt the exact same way that your dad did. You had this creativity inside of you. Like, it all makes you a part of who you are. But look at how it influences other people and the way that your story. I mean, I know that this is going to impact somebody that's listening. There's a reason why you're here right now. Somebody listening to this is going to be impacted, you know. He's definitely had an impact. He's had an impact on my life. You know, that's for Mm -hmm. sure. So that's why. That's cool. I asked him to come and wanted people to hear his stuff. And I mean, that's just a fucking glimpse. You know, <laughs> the iceberg. I mean, we could sit here and do a 12 hour podcast for like three weeks straight every day. Oh, and it's a 12 part series. You know, yeah. you know how it is. Mini book. It's like fucking Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Magic Wars. the Gathering. Yeah. <laughs> but it's dirty trash dildos. It's like Lord of the Rings with dildos. You know, but yeah. he, um, you know, Jay has been, uh, he, he might not know this, but he's been a very positive influence for me. You know, and he's 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 the type of friend who he has checked me in certain ways sometimes where, you know, I needed to be checked instead of just cosigning my bullshit and and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, we don't talk every day, but when we do, we always tell each other we love him. We love each other. Yeah. And if I had to make a call and say, hey, I'm into some bad stuff right here, he would be the one that shows up, you know, cinder block cool, in hand and, yeah, yeah. and everything. Ready and and I just I've always appreciated his friendship and his truth. So. Oh, fuck yeah. Thank you. Yeah, dude. And, you know, the one thing I wanted to share real quick, bro, you know, like everyone has their different thoughts when it comes to spirituality and all of those types of things. Right. But my wife and I recently had this conversation because she had a brother who was like, I, you, you referred to yourself as like a lightning bolt. Is that what you was like earlier? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? My wife had a brother who was not Flash Gordon. No, because I beat him in a foot race. <laughs> one time. I will say this outside his sister's house. We foot raced. He said I cheated, but I smoked his ass. <laughs> Yes, not Flash smoke. Gordon. Not <laughs> Flash Gordon. Maybe Thor. It takes Listen. me a while to get going these days, man. <laughs> that funny. was a few years ago. It's like a semi truck getting started. I can up. barely yeah, even gotta walk. Get through, gotta get through seven gears before you're like into full stride. Where are you going, dude? I know. It was that, like that was a long time coming. That was like he's like, yeah. there's no way you could beat me in a foot race. Could, foot race. And I'm like rocks, dude. Well, I'll, I'll fucking dude. I'll smoke you, dude. It's just on and on. So next thing you know, we're out out front of his sister's house down the street. You know, concrete street. I beat him, dude. I was just trying not to fall, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yard sale, dude. Fucking scorpion, you know. <laughs> I mean, I haven't been going that fast in I don't know how long, you know. It's like slow motion. You're going like, holy shit. I don't even know if we should do this right like, I don't even know how I'm going to stop at how this point, dude. You're like, what do you got to like, I don't see. There's nothing soft to land yeah. in. It's all concrete. Yeah, <laughs> practices. This is not going to be bad. Grass. Yeah. And then you just throw yourself over. Yeah. Like, what the uh, fuck were you doing? Like, was, I didn't think I could stop, so I just I'm threw myself sorry, Buddha, I just fucking yeah. No, 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 you're just, good, man. That's the kind of shit we just talk and blah, blah, yeah. blah. We end up fucking, we start over here in Argentina, and we end up in fucking Kuwait. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, dude, I, I just, for me, bro, you know, I just, I'm, the story that you shared about your son, I know it's a hard thing to, to dip into, bro, and, you know, and this is, this is just something that I wanted to share with you, because this has always put me in a good spot. You know, like you said, you referred to yourself I think it was a lightning bolt, right? There's certain people who are are meant to stay in the sky for a while, like a star. And there's people that are shooting stars, bro. They're here for a small amount of time, but they make such a huge impact on the people that they are around. And my wife's brother was very similar to that. I, like spirituality, faith, all that's been real new for me. But one of the things it says is like, you know, the good die young, pretty much. Like good people pass away and the righteous often die before their time. But no one seems to wonder why. No one seems to understand that God sometimes protects them from certain things like evil. You know, I just wanted to share that with you, man, because my wife's brother was one of those people, too. He impacted the people he was around. And the fact that you felt in your heart, 
you know, my son's not going to be here very long. And you see how much he transformed and he changed in that time when he was in recovery, man. It's like, you know, it's all like, like there's been something spiritual with you this whole time. You know what I mean? And I just, I just wanted to thank you, bro. Cause I know that that shit's not easy to talk about. You know what I'm saying? And just to, to give you a little bit of love, man. You thank know? you, man. I appreciate it, bro. Yeah. It's good to meet you guys too, man. I always, you know, like so good people, dude. I appreciate it. Heck yeah, man. And, and before we leave, how did you two meet? We were hey, hey. Hey, hey, I'd seen him around. Oh, know. so so no, we were um, we started going to the gym, going to meetings, uh, you know, stuff like that. We I think we gravitated towards each other a little bit more because the loyalty he's he saw how very loyal and yeah, honest yeah. and yeah. whatever I am, you yeah, know, yeah. and and the people we did yeah. hang out with, they're the type that'll turn around and stab you in the back. Right. Yeah. You know, well, most people, man. You know, it's a character thing, man. Not everybody has character, dude. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. it just it just has gone from there. When, you know, That's he had this cool. little spot in Tempe. We'd we'd walk down to Circle K and get the Ben and Jerry's, oh, yeah. you know, pints and the smoke cigars. Yeah. Dude, yeah. And then yeah. you know, one last story though. This is the funniest shit ever. One of them. We come back and his fucking Schw- his pride Schwinn oh, was man. gone. We just oh, walked shit, to Circle dude. K, which was four houses down. From his little spot in Tempe, and we get back, and he's like, "My fucking bike's gone." So <laughs> he gets in his fucking car, <laughs> and he's going down mill. I'm on it, dude. I'm, I'm There's like, my motherfucking bike. Jumps out, fucking cold clocks the dude. He's riding it. Cold cock nothing. He was no, he, was he, he watched the pipe because he watched it come right down the channel. I said, "Hey, homie, that's my bike. <laughs> you stole the wrong motherfucker's bike, dude. What's <laughs> oh, shit. up?" He gets on his bike, rides at home. He tells me, "Take, bring the car home, Maddie." Like Debo. <laughs> I, was just, I was just laughing and shit, dude. And I'm like, "You, you sure that's your bike?" <laughs> He's like looking at it again. Oh, yes, yeah. my bike. As the dude's He's knocked out, out, like unconscious. <laughs> dude, oh so, shit! I don't uh, think it's this. We my went bike. and we finished our ice cream. Hey, you know, dude stole my bike. Man. All before it melted. Too. It's like it's both. It all it happened just... before the ice cream melted too. This was a 1960 something Schwinn Wasp. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and it stayed. Can't man um, in the walls. It stayed uh, we'll locked that up shit to up. my house to the cinder block <laughs> yeah. wall yeah. with a motorcycle lock. I didn't take it out very often, dude. Yeah, yeah. and I could. It was good though. Let me tell you. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you coming. Really, yeah, did. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Fuck yeah, dude. Thank you so much. Um, I have to pee so bad. Yeah. Oh, you're good. You're good. All right. Uh, you, you can go ahead and go. I'll end oh, it right thanks, now. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, give another warm round of applause to our homeboy, Jason. Thank you for coming, man, and sharing your, your story. You guys have a beautiful weekend, and we will see you next week. Much love. Peace. What's going on, everybody? This is Buddha from the RCast, and I just wanted to thank you for checking out this week's episode. It means a lot, and if you could share it with a friend or a loved one, somebody you need in recovery, or maybe somebody who just needs that little bit of extra positivity in their life, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you would like to join us here on the RCast, either in the studio live or online, hit us up. The links are down in the show notes of this episode, and on there, you can find direct links to our main website here at America's Rehab Campus and all of our social media platforms. Follow us. We keep the posts positive and motivational focused on recovery, health, and wellness. As you know, in this modern day and age, we need as much love as possible, y'all. And as always, if you or somebody you know is in need of substance abuse treatment, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're open 24 hours a day, and our direct phone number is 1-833-272-7342. Once again, that phone number is 1-833-272-7342. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Much love, and God bless. Peace.